Hi. <clears throat> well, let me first uh, thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to this, this wonderful conference in this beautiful city. Um, I, should, I should point out that, of course, it's incredibly intimidating um, being invited to give an overview in only an hour of such a vibrant and active field as Scattering Amplitudes has turned out to be over the past few years. Um, but uh, eight weeks ago, I managed to break my leg, and I found out that uh, I wouldn't be able to put weight on it for 12 weeks. And all of a sudden, I felt immediately better because I figured that worst case uh, scenario, we could always blame, uh, blame the outcome on my pain medication. So with that in mind, uh, I'll just uh, I'll leap right into it. So I was asked to give a big picture overview. So the first thing I did was uh, Google around for a big picture that made me think of uh, scattering amplitudes. And I started thinking about how I was going to organize and collapse this talk into something that could fit in an hour. And first, it's, it's def defining sort of the subset of the community of the people's work I'm going to be talking about. And, um, and it's, it's sort of arbitrary, because a lot of what all of us do at the heart involves interaction. Some sense involves an S matrix. But uh, I decided to use um, the. Uh, the 2003 paper by, by Edward as a, as a sort of a defining line that anybody who's actively working and scattering amplitudes uh, right now has cited this at least once. And so your name is going to be in this big S for S matrix. And so this is, this is sort of, this is what I'm carving out. And then, and then to talk about sort of the verbs of what goes on, the action within the community, I started listing some things. So of course, one thing that we always do is we do new calculations, uh, or we figure out new ways of doing old calculations, or we discover new structure, uh, or then we take our insights that we've gained from scattering amplitudes and we apply them somewhere else. But of course, it's not, it's not some you know, hierarchical or linear list like this. It's, it's a graph where every node is speaking to every other node, and I just didn't draw the connection here because I didn't want to mess up uh, this, this horizontal line. So, so with this in mind, I, I started thinking about, well, all of these. And you, you'll see as I talk, I'm actually going to talk about each of these things. But what I'm going to start with and what I'm going to focus on is, is new structure, or a, an apprehension of structure that we first saw the hint of uh, many, many years ago. And so, so this is the key structural development is that lots of theories' predictions are related to each other. They share basic key ingredients. Um, and and this, this goes under the name sort of double copy structure that, that many, of, many of our favorite theories, and I'll, I'll have a nice list of our favorite theories in a little bit, have, have a double copy structure that share ingredients by peeling ingredients off of one and sticking to another. You're talking about different theories. And, there's sort of three different ways of looking at this, at least at tree level. And the first goes back to Kuai Luang Tai in 85, with the relationship between uh, expressing closed tree level string amplitudes in terms of sums over products of open, of Shan Payton stripped open tree amplitudes, and then color kinematics in 2008, and then this, this recent beautiful development in 2013 with scattering equations and the CHY formalism. Okay, and so to get a look at the people who I'm going to be talking about in this subsection, they're all here. Uh, and if anybody wants a Mathematica script for this, I'm happy to share it. So I do believe in open science, after all. So, all right, without further ado, let's talk about color kinematics and double copy construction. And to give a feel to this, and since I was asked to give this sort of broadly for not necessarily people who have been paying attention to scattering amplitudes, to give a feel for this, I like to ask people to start off by considering a villanelle. And if you don't remember what a villanelle is, it's a tightly constrained poem. OK, so here's, here's a beautiful example of a villanelle by Dylan Thomas. I'm not going to ask you to read it, but I will ask you to notice some features. One is that all these lines are the same. All these lines are the same. All these words rhyme. And all these words rhyme. So what's going on, there's some sort of minimal information going in, and the relations propagating it to a full solution. Now I'd like you to consider an amplitude. And so this is an arbitrary representation 
of three loops in the maximally supersymmetric gauge theory and, uh, and then the maximally supersymmetric gravity theory. We're just supposed to interpret these as, as these are, these are cubic graphs, and we're going to be dressing them with some kinematic weight and for the gauge theory. There'll also be a color weight by dressing every vertex with FABCs. And then the gravity is just the kinematic weight, and the propagators come as if these were some sort of scalar phi, some sort of massless uh, propagating information. Okay, what I'd like you to notice is a certain structure here, that all these graphs come with the same kinematic weight here, and the gravity has the square of it. All these graphs come with the kinematic weight here, and gravity is the square of it. Now, these aren't the square, but you'll notice a little bit of rhyming right, between, between these graphs and the other graphs, and echoes in the gravity. But then there's all this other stuff, right? But in, in this, was some, this was some arbitrary representation. This is just what fit the data. It was a representation we came up with. But we imposed no special structure on it. Once you apprehend the structure of color kinematics, so something fairly spectacular happens at three loops, it turns out that you can express all of three loops by adding three more graphs in terms of just linear functions of this graph you're labeled. And once you specify this guy, then relations propagate to the rest. And this structure goes under the name of color kinematics. And so what you may not recognize is this, or maybe you do, this is a graphical representation of a Jacobi identity. So if I dress every vertex in the graphs with FABCs, then the color weight of this graph would be the color weight of this graph plus the color weight of this graph. This is what, this is what structure constants do for a living. But it turns out for gauge theories, you can find representations where the kinematic weights that are tied to the theory intimately also obey these self-same relations, anti-symmetry and Jacobi. And when you do, you've got things in a form where you can start pulling them apart and putting them together with other objects that obey those same algebraic relationships, getting other theories. In this case, if you strip off the color weights and replace them with another copy of kinematic weights, you start landing on gravity theories. And if you, know, if you start with n equals 4 supersymmetry and you do another copy of n equals 4, you're talking about n equals 8 all the way down to n equals zero, and it doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be a supersymmetric gang mills theory. Turns out effective theories like um, nonlinear sigma model, all, uh, like the Chiral Lagrangian, they all play and they all obey these relationships, as we'll talk, as I'll talk more. All right, but to be very concrete, it, um, there's a generic d-dimensional structure uh, for yang mills theories. First, that you can describe everybody on the same scaffolding. So one, one reason you might be surprised if you want to put gauge theory and gravity theories on the same footing, on the same scaffolding, locally, graph by graph, would be because you know that yang Mills has a quartic contact term and that gravity has a quartic and a kintic and, and all the way on up, right? They're, they're finding contact points for all interactions. But you can always assign that to cubic graphs by multiplying and dividing by a propagator, the same propagator multiplying and dividing by one, and it turns out that there is, at tree level, always such an assignation of the four-point contact for gauge theories such that your kinematic weights of your gauge theory obey the same uh, algebraic relations as, as your color weights, namely anti-symmetry and Jacobi for theories in the adjoint. And when you have, when you have it in such a representation, well, what's this color weight doing for a living and satisfying anti-symmetry in Jacobi? And so you can replace it with another copy of a kinematic weight, and then you're talking about scattering and gravity. And this is, this is proven to all multiplicity at tree level for, uh, for an, a number of theories. If you see a glint in Albert's eye, what you might notice are two copies of Yang and Mills staring back at you. So... <clears throat> Uh, this has a, is there a valid multi-loop generalization? Yeah, well, this is certainly a conjecture, and it's a very natural one, that exactly the same thing holds, but now it's at the level of the integrand, um, where every, every graph that would be related, every set of three graphs that would be related by uh, Jacobi relations in the color weight should be related by kinematic relations in its kinematic weight. That part is conjectural, right? And so we've got various uh, examples as, as we go to higher and higher loop order in, in various theories. But what's not conjectural is once you achieve this through unitarity, you know that by replacing the color weight with the kinematic weight, you'll be talking about the valid integrand for, uh, for your resulting double copy theory. And this is, this is due to the fact 
that this object satisfies all the tree level cuts. Okay, so, all right, the scattering amplitudes of many relativistic theories admit a double copy numerator algebra, so it's not just the angles and gravity. This points to previously hidden structure in many theories, and it's structure that's gener generally yet to be understood the level of action, although in the past year, we've seen some spectacular progress, specifically um, with, uh, with the nonlinear sigma model. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, so let me just make, make this very concrete. So we've got incredibly phenomenological theories like the chiral Lagrangian that satisfy color kinematics and QCD. We've got very formal theories, or at least formal so far. So what I've drawn here is, uh, is an attractor model, alpha attractor model that cosmologists love. And it turns out one of the easiest ways to write this is with uh, constrained nilpotent superfields. These constrained nilpotent superfields are one-to-one -one with Volkov and Kulov, and Volkov and Kulov's a double copy. Um, and it turns out both open and closed strings, at least at tree level, can be seen as field theory double copies. And I'll explain more about that as we continue. All right, so I drew this, I drew this graph basically to put the names of many of the people who have worked on these various theories. But what I want you to pay attention to is the next bit where I took all the ingredients on this side, and I just put them on top, and everything you get is just different ways of combining these guys in various ways. Okay, so a lot of our favorite theories, a lot of our favorite predictions, you can get, you can understand, you can appreciate as double copy theories. In fact, it's a very open question, what theories you cannot understand as double copies. Okay. Now, to get a handle on some of the, the progress over the past few years, I'm going to introduce you to a way that I think about, about this, um, this double copy relationship, and it's a way that lets you sort of look at the amplitude as one, as one object, uh, and that's, that's to use the language of graphs of graphs. All right, so let's set it up with the four point. Um, so we start with a S channel diagram, right? And I'm going to define a U hat operator that takes my S channel diagram to the U channel diagram. And so it maintains all the edges except for the one it's being operated on. It just changes the connectivity of that edge. So you go from the S channel diagram to the U channel diagram. Similarly, from S to T. And with that, we've got all the three graphs that contribute to the full color dressed. The angles amplitude or the gravity amplitude at four point tree level. And so this is a representation of the, uh, of the four point amplitude. And this graph, this triangle graph right here, um, it, every triangle you can also see as a potential for a Jacobi relation to be satisfied in these graphs of graphs. Now, <clears throat> graphs contributing to an ordered tree amplitude. So many, many of you may have heard or are going to be familiar from string theory with like sort of Shan Payton ordered amplitudes, right? You take the low energy limits, a color ordered tree amplitude in Yang Mills. So these color ordered tree amplitudes, these guys, well, first of all, they have to maintain color order. And the operator that maintains color order is T hat. So you start with anybody that has, that has the color order you want, any graph that has a color order you want at the multiplicity you care about. And then you just operate with T hat until closure. Okay, and so this guy goes to this guy, this guy goes to this guy, and so on and so forth till closure. And it turns out that by tracing out with T hat until closure, you generate the one skeleton of a polytope. It's a, it's a famous classical polytope called the sociohedra. Um, okay, so you can ask how many of these polytopes, sorry, how many sociohedra do you need? to completely describe a full color dress scattering amplitude, or in terms of gravity, it would be a kinematic dressed scattering amplitude. Um, and you might think it would be n minus 2 factorial, or 6, right? Because that's the number, at 5 point, it would be 6. So that's the number of different pentagons that I'd need to touch every vertex at least once. Right? So these are all the graphs that contribute this by operating with both s hat and, sorry, t hat and u hat until closure. So these are all the graphs that contribute. In fact, this choice, we use m minus 2 factorial guys to describe the entire thing, is called the Kleist coefficients, and it's proven sufficient by Del Duca, Dixon, and Maltoni. So this is certainly one way to talk about the full scattering amplitude using m minus 2 factorial of these associohedra. But when you realize 
that both your color weights and your kinematic weights, or in fact, or whatever your theory is, if both guys can be described such they satisfy Jacobi, every triangle pushes inwards. So every triangle on the outside pushes inwards, and then these guys push inwards, and these guys push inwards. And so you have these so you only need to specify this data, and then Jacobi relations propagate to the inner, and then Jacobi relations propagate again. So it turns out you only need to specify this boundary data, and Jacobi relations propagate the information into the bulk. So this reduces the set of necessary color ordered amplitudes, or uh, color stripped amplitudes, the sociohedra, to only n minus 3 factorial, or 2 at 5 points. So you just need this guy and this guy to, set, to specify all my boundary data. Right? And this, the fact that you could describe it in terms of 6 or in terms of 2 sets up relations between the 6, and these are known as the n minus 3 factorial, or BCJ relations, where you specify guys in terms of a basis of n minus 3 factorial color ordered amplitudes. Okay, so what's this boundary data? It turns out this boundary data is what happens when you start with a given color order. So in this case, I'm only labeling what I'm changing. I'll fix legs five and four, and then I'll change one, two, and three. And so u hat on this guy turns me to two, one, three, and u hat on this guy turns me to two, three, one. So I operate on u hat till closure. Turns out operating on u hat till closure gives me another polytope, and it's called the permutahedron. And this is the boundary data I need to entirely specify everything if everything satisfies you. So I only need this boundary data, right, this, this boundary data to get everybody. Oh, and I should say, and this is something that's kind of novel and interesting, is that so we're used to these color ordered amplitudes, or these pentagons being gauge invariant objects. It turns out these permutahedra are also gauge invariant objects, and you can, you can use them in cuts and all sorts of things uh, in much the same way as you use color ordered amplitudes. In any case, since, since there are going to be m minus 2 factorial of these guys and m minus 3 factorial of these guys, you can solve for this in terms of this, but it turns out you'll have residual gauge freedom. Things that won't, that won't matter physically, it doesn't matter how you set them, they'll always cancel in whatever physical prediction you make. You can ask what's that residual gauge freedom for. We don't know, but we suspect it's to let you actually satisfy color kinematics at loop level. It certainly gives you the freedom to satisfy color kinematics at loop level. OK, so just to drive this, some of the building blocks at six points. So this is operating t hat till closure, starting with a six point amplitude. You'll notice that you start off with three internal propagators. So you have three relationships, right, for your t hat. And similarly, for your u hat, so this is a set of masters that the guys you need to specify for Jacobi to propagate all the information into the bulk. To remind you, there are 105 cubic graphs at six points, so they're all in here, but they're all, they're all specified once you specify this bulk permutahedra. Right? And so this set of masters is fixed by six of these associahedra. You can solve for these guys in terms of these guys, and then the residual gauge freedom. All right, so just to, just to drive home this sort of summary, the gauge invariant building blocks, it speaks to the theory we think of as color-ordered amplitudes that are formed by, uh, by the one skeleton of a sociohedra. Color kinematics means that you only need to specify the boundary graphs, these guys, and you can solve for these guys in terms of these guys, and doing so, specify everybody. Okay. And it turns out this geometric picture wasn't something we were looking for, this actually this sort of emerged when I was trying to find ways of describing this to people that didn't involve just putting lots of large matrices on a blackboard. Um, but, uh, but I think there's actually something really special about these guys. And in fact, there was a very recent paper um, by, uh, by a grad student in Perimeter uh, who's talking about a sociohedra and some of the topological properties. So I think this is something that, uh, that, that'll have some legs that'll be fun to play with. For those of you who actually want to see some equations, just so you ground this somewhere, let me just write down what's going on again. So the full yang mill scattering amplitude you can write down in terms of cubic graphs. Everybody has color weights and kinematic weights and then running over propagators. Color ordered amplitude, you'll only write down graphs consistent with that color order. You'll have kinematic weights 
over the propagators. Remember, these kinematic weights satisfy anti-symmetry the same way that color weights do. Now, we call these things color-stripped Yang-Mills, but that's a little prejudicial. We could also call them kinematic-stripped gravity, and it would be exactly the same thing. If you strip along a, a kinematic ordering here, you'd end up with the same exact objects that you do stripping color weights from, from Yang-Mills. Similarly, kinematic stripped Yang Mills, when you pull off the kinematics, lands you on the same thing as color stripped by a joint scalar. So you have a scalar theory that's charged under two flavors. Um, now you can always pseudo invert for your kinematic weights in terms of some functions of some set of color ordered partial amplitudes. Uh, this is not unique. This, this pseudo inversion is not unique because you have freedom in which, which these guys you satisfy. And also, there are more of these guys than there are independent of these guys. So there are various choices for this. And it turns out, as I'll show in a slide or two, that one such choice is actually the KLT matrix, um, or the KLT kernel. What would happen if you took the original Kawhi Luang tie relations from so many years ago, you take the lower limit, you see that as a matrix taking products between two sets of color-ordered partial amplitudes. That matrix product actually serves to, uh, that, that, that kernel serves to take color-ordered amplitudes to Jacobi-satisfying numerators. Um, I'll point out you can only pseudo-invert these guys uh, if, if they aren't independent in uh, n minus 2 factorial, right? If there exists an n minus 3 factorial basis, you see I've pulled out this n here, right? So there's going to be some function of kinematics over kinematics relating everybody in an n minus 2 factorial basis into an n minus 3 factorial basis. And this happens for all of these theories we're talking about. Um, and it turns out if you assume these, these guys are proportional to generalized Taylor factors, then you can derive something spectacular and beautiful, which has been around in the community for a really long time, but has caused an upsurge in, in, in uh, in, in amplitude investigation over the past few years. And this, these are the scattering equations. First seen in high energy fixed angle strings by Gross and Mende. Uh, also seen the four dimensional connected prescription to the twister string of Witten by Oivon Spratt and Volovich. But now as the d dimensional Yang Mills and gravity, and then all these extensions that have come out over the past few years. And so you can see Yvonne's talk for how this and this end and the CHY formalism. Is, is letting her go after uh, loops in a particularly elegant way. Uh, and, and one thing that's spectacular about that, I'm not gonna actually going to spend a lot of time talking about scattering equations and the CHY formalism, but what it does let you do is it lets you very naturally prove all multiplicity things about, about your, theory, your theory's amplitudes. It's, it's a, it, it lets you very elegantly go to all multiplicity. And one of the dreams is to be able to talk very elegantly about all loop order. And so this seems like a very natural sort of place to be looking at if you want to elegantly make all loop order statements. So, so this is definitely, this is something you care about and this is something you should be paying attention to. Okay, but let's talk about how you can get KLT type relations from color kinematics. So I set up, say, gravity as a kinematic weight by kinematic weight over propagators. I said you could get the kinematic weights by taking the inverse of propagators on color-ordered trees, and you do that for both copies. You pull out the color-ordered trees, and this leftover object is exactly a KLT matrix. And it turns out there are many, many different ways of writing it, depending upon what basis you choose on each side. You can make it more symmetric and less symmetric. It doesn't matter. It all ends on the same thing. Um, and uh, so yeah, but this is the KLT matrix that has been, it was first written down for field theory by, by Zv and Lance, and, and these guys uh, in 99, and then in 2010, 2011, there was an upsurge in finding different ways of writing these using these various n minus two factorial and n minus three factorial relations, constraining these guys to, uh, to various bases. Um, <clears throat> now, so starting off with this sort of KLT description of a scattering amplitude, this is, this is how we see that, that the KLT kernel is actually uh, secretly uh, also this sort of inverse propagator structure. See, so this is equal to this. So Del Duca, Dixon, Maltoni showed that I could always talk about the full thing 
in terms of color order amplitudes, multiplied by color weights of the graphs of the permutahedron. They didn't say permutahedron, but they did say multiperiphal graph, which means half ladder, and all the permutations, right? And so what you see is that these color weights that satisfy Jacobi are given by the KLT matrix uh, multiplied by the set of color ordered, color dressed uh, amplitudes in the biojoint theory. And so we get that one representation for our inverse propagators is a KLT. And it's a special one. It's the one that sets everybody, every, uh, every one of these every one of these vertices to zero than it can, and then the rest, the n minus two factorial left over, end up being non-local. But the KLT does, satis does set up Jacobi satisfying numerators, even though they're non-local. Um, okay, and, and this does indeed work for, uh, for gravity, that the kinematic weights are, are uh, given, these guys are given by a KLT kernel multiplied by, uh, so one version, one representation that satisfies Jacobi is given by the KLT kernel by the trees. And this was first announced, I think, uh, at Amplitudes 2010 by Michael Kiermeyer, and but also simultaneously with Garen Bohr, Damgard, Sundergaard, and Van Hove in 2010. Okay, so <clears throat> you can generalize these color kinematic numerators to off-shell multi-loop integrands. One way of doing so is by introducing Anzot and this sort of the normal crew and all sorts of people who've done really fun stuff. And I'm sure I haven't written down everybody. I'd like to call very special attention to Gang Yang, who, to my knowledge, did the first five-loop maximally supersymmetric supergravity calculation, which is a form factor. Um, but he did it in a way that was uh, satisfying color kinematics uh, at five loops by introducing Anzot and imposing things. Other ways by introducing a massive over redundancy in graphs. This is this is the sort of the pre antigrand approach. You could exploit the BRST invariance of pure spinner superstrings, and uh, Carlos and Oliver have been doing this. You recycle for limits in the CHY formalism, and Song and Oliver and Jang have been doing this. You can also generalize these n minus three factorial relations to see what type of relations exist for loop level integrands and loop level amplitudes. These guys have been doing that. And you can take the CHY tree representation to loop integrand via the amplitude twister string. We'll be hearing more uh, from, uh, from Yvonne about this in a little bit. Let's say, oh, goodness, sorry. Let's say you don't want to do that, okay? Let's say you don't want to care about rearranging your representation to satisfy any color kinematic sort of identities or jumping up and down at all. You just want to take your gauge theory and you know that you should have a gravity theory that's related to it you just want to go after it directly. You can say, is there a way to do this? And the answer is yes. And it's very natural, okay? The idea is that you take all the, so, so what does this mean to take an arbitrary representation? What this means is generically, you're not gonna satisfy Jacobi's on all triangles, right? So all the triangles I write down, I'm not gonna be satisfying Jacobi's. So you take the double copy of your non-vanishing Jacobi's Right? And you use that to define a contact term in your gravity, a contact graph in your gravity theory. And by doing so, you're encoding the correction of naively squaring something that didn't satisfy Jacobi's. And, uh, and this, this, this is spectacular. This, this lets you fly at, at multi-loops. You don't have to go searching for, for representation. You just start writing things down. And so I want to I want to show you I want to show you an example of how this works. Um, uh, so how does this come together for a full integrand? Just a second of background. How do you know you're talking about something? So I hand you I hand you five loops, maximally supersymmetric supergravity. How do you know that I haven't just handed you a load of garbage? How do you know it's actually correct, right? And a sufficient criteria is that it satisfies all the unitarity cuts. So the same unitarity cuts you would apply to what you would have built by Feynman rules if, if my graphical representation satisfies that for all unitarity cuts, then, then we know that, that there's no missing information and we're actually talking about the same theory. The reason it's not necessary, the reason it's only sufficient, is because it's possible to also give you total derivatives that screw up with cuts, but, but we're, not gonna, we're not gonna talk about it. So we're just gonna demand that we satisfy all the cuts, be done. 
Okay, now the beautiful thing about unitarity cuts is their span, which if I, what that means is if I have a cut that I know is true, then any way of breaking up that cut by blowing up propagators and cutting them is automatically satisfied. This means you can roll up your check, you can roll up your verifiability into a small number of high multiplicity trees being sewn together rather than having to go after every cut individually. Okay, so that's, that's the power of cut spanning. And that's incredibly powerful. There's a handful of cuts needs to be checked at four loops to know that you've actually got the correct amplitude, the correct integrand. Um, but the nice thing about easy verification is it also gives you a natural means of construction, right? Because you can say, well, one way of constructing is to demand, to demand that I satisfy all the cuts. So you start with everybody on shell. So you take all the cubic graphs you could possibly write down that have the right number of external legs and the right number of loops, right? All planar, non-planar. And you demand that each graph satisfies the maximal cut where all edges are put on shell, d-dimensionally. Okay, and that's the invariant information that needs to be associated with a local representation of that guy. Now, it's not necessarily everything. What, are, what could you be missing? You could be missing things that vanish when propagators are put on shell. You could be missing things that are proportional to propagators, right? And so to find that missing bit, you start releasing cut conditions. So in this case, right, you start, uh, you collapse a propagator, right? And by collapsing a propagator, uh, you're, you're now accessing the information that was proportional to that propagator squared. It's no longer being cut. And so you do this, and this, so we call this maximal cuts next to maximal cuts, and then we next to next to maximal cuts, and so on, releasing propagators, gathering your information until you have everything, right? Until there's no missing information. There's nothing hiding. There's no possible climbing contribution that escaped your notice. Um, so your final answer is no cut conditions. So with that in mind, let's look at a full three-loop example of the power of just going directly after the gravity amplitude without trying to put things in a special representation. Okay, so we're going to start with that representation I showed you before where gravity wasn't naively the square, right? There was this missing information. I was sorry, extra information. It was other stuff. Okay, we start with these guys, these, these nine graphs. We dress them like this, and we're going to assign to the square, we're going to assign the square of these contributions as the kinematic weight for the maximally supersymmetric supergravity graph. Now, that's not going to be the end of the story. It's just the beginning of the story. It's just a starting point, but you get a lot for free by doing this. One thing you get for free is that all the maximal cuts are automatically satisfied, as they must be. All the all the next to maximal cuts are automatically satisfied, as they must be, because every four-point four graph satisfies Jacobi no matter what representation. There's no way of assigning a contact term to an on-shell four-point graph such that it doesn't satisfy Jacobi. What that means is rolling up one propagator condition, all these cuts are automatically satisfied. Turns out with that arbitrary representation, most of these guys are automatically satisfied too because most of the edges satisfy Jacobi, or at least one of, the one of the pairs in the double copy would. So there were only four non-vanishing cuts, only four guys that don't agree with what truth is on the cut. And you need to add four contact contributions to take care of these guys. By contact contributions, you see this five-point guy, this five-point guy, and I've got a four-point guy here and a four-point guy here, and a five-point guy here, right? So these are, the only, these are the only contributions that are missing. And you can just write them down in terms of algebraic relations on your gauge theory. You just calculate what these triangles are. Most of them are zero, right? But the ones that aren't zero square to give you this contribution for this guy, and this contribution for this guy, this contribution for this guy, and this contribution for this guy. And that's it. You're done. You have the three loop n equals eight supergravity without monkeying around at all. And you just wrote it down. I want to show you a few more examples, but because we're serious people, I'm going to show you some five loop examples. Um, five loops, here's a potential uh, n squared contact. 
right? So you see there, it's at five points, so I've collapsed one propagator, and I've collapsed another propagator next to it, so I've got a five-point contact. This is serious. Um, five loops is definitely not a joke. Uh, just to, to, to make it clear, you, you write it down, just as I said before, but once you're done writing it down, you've got eight pages of uh, dressing, right, from, from the five loop maximally supersymmetric gauge theory, full color dress gauge theory representation we wrote down around five years ago. Okay, but sure, it's, it's, it's a lot, but you just wrote it down, and it's true. Um, the reason it's a, one, one way to see why it's eight is, is uh, eight pages is to look at what's actually coming in from the gauge theory. All these graphs are very far from planar, and they're very far from the latter graphs. They tend to be very complicated. Just one of these guys, this guy, this is the kinematic weight in the gauge theory. I, instead of labeling the different loops, like L1 and L3, and you wouldn't be able to read it anyway, I just gave the different loops different colors. Um, OK, so how would you do this? How would you do this the old way? The way you do it the old way is first, you'd write down uh, what the truth of the cut is. And the truth of the cut, you can, you can find by well, finding a Jacobi satisfying representation using KLT, which is going to give you something non-local, right? Non-local dressings for two of these, two of these uh, numerators and the rest would be set to zero. Anyway, you end up with 26 pages of what the cut needs to be for this guy. What you're going to do is you're going to subtract away what you dressed the masters with, and it turns out that gives you 26 pages. All right, but instead you just write it down, and this is it's it is the same answer, right? It is the same answer, but you avoided having to jump up and down on these massive analytic expressions. Okay, just one more example uh, of potential empty cubed contacts. So this is a six-point guy. Now the way you get at this is it's truth minus uh, minus the parent squared, what you dress the parents as, minus any n squared contacts that existed. And so you take this cut, and then you take an off-shell continuation of this cut data. Um, but it's beautiful. You can just write it down, right? So you write down your, uh, your truth. I mean, you, you, so it's, it's basically just your, uh, your six-point data minus, minus all the relevant five-point data, and, and you land directly on this contact graph. Just to show you what you'd be dealing with if you were do doing it the old way, there are 105 cubic graphs that contribute to the six point. This is again very non planar, far from the latter graphs. Um, so you have about 30 pages from just the truth of the cut. You have 35 pages from what your parents said should be there. You got another 25 pages from the relevant n squared contributions, but instead you just write it down. Okay, just to summarize, that color kinematics and generalized uh, gauge invariance, gauge transforms, gives you a, a way to double copy directly non-color kinematic representations, resulting in additional local higher point graphs. So of course, when you're in the, the angelic representation, when you're in the representation where all your Jacobs are satisfied, you have no contact terms, right? But the moment you start violating, you can still double copy, and the only cost is these additional higher vertex guys. Now these guys are gonna come in with the worst manifest power counting, why? because they're missing loop momentum from the denominator. You've collapsed propagators, right? So automatically, they're coming in with bad power counting. But if all you want is an answer, this is the way to go. I'll point out that control through five point means all n squared cuts, no matter what loop level you're, you're talking about. Control through six point gives you all n cubed cuts, no matter what level, and so on. So um, this is multiplicity and loop order independent. It works for any double copy theory because of the single copy properties, super Yang mills not my sigma model, Z theory. It provides a simple path forward for tough to crack multi-loop integrands. And so uh, with that, I'd like to uh, point out that we now have um, the five loop N equals eight supergravity integrand as of this past month. Um, yeah. So, and uh, it's passed many checks. We verify, so, so the only data that could be there from the theory, the worst possible count power counting is through n to the six maximal cuts. So you verify that there's nothing missing on n to the seven maximal cuts. You've collapsed seven propagators. You do all those cuts. That's one way of verifying that you have the right result. Another way of verifying is you start integrating. 
and you check that the, the 22 over 5th top level is, is UV finite. Um, nobody expects a UV divergence or a critical dimension of 22 over fifths. The most pessimistic guess is that, uh, is that it's 24 over fifths. And this is, this is what everybody's waiting for. This is, this is sort of the crux of the calculation. We'll be integrating in 24 fifths and seeing if it is UV finite or not. Uh, just to remind you, this is the first potential critical dimension challenging n equals 8 having the same perturbative UV behavior as a maximally supersymmetric gauge theory, um, which n equals 4 super Yang mills would have a 26 over fifths divergence, critical dimension. And so we have to see where n equals 8 supergravity is. But now we have the integrand, and we're hard at work integrating. And it's possible that by Redu's talk next week, uh, there may be new information. OK, wait for time. All right, good. So I'd like to spend a second or two talking about playful construction. What do I mean by playful construction? So of course, one way of calculating scattering amplitudes is to take data from theories you know, right? Quantum field theory, non relativistic quantum mechanics, string theory, what, what have you, and building out just crunching either through Feynman rules or taking symmetry properties you know that that theory has and imposing and, and churning and so forth. Another way, of course, is to start with the symmetries that you care about, scaling and geometry, impose that, then see what theories you end up talking about. Um, and so I'm going to talk about playful construction using double copy as a principle. So you take theories that exhibit double copy structure, you pull off a piece, and you stick on another piece that nobody ever thought of, and you see if that's a valid theory. Does that make sense? Is it interesting or fun? And one example is all the uh, Einstein Yang Mills work of, of these guys is, is much in the same spirit of setting up, you know, interesting, you know, interesting gauge theory uh, algebras beyond the joint, making your kinematics satisfy those interesting algebras, then stripping off your color weights, sticking back on kinematic weights, and seeing what type of things show up. And some of the things that show up are Einstein, Yang, little supergravities of various types. Another way is to start with a generic ansatz and constrain engineering weight, impose your algebra, and then see what sort of theories you land on. I'm going to talk about the first type, and I'm going to start with the open string. Now, uh, Johannes Brodel, uh, Oliver Slaughter, and Stefan Stieberger in 2013 showed that the open string satisfies a, is, has a field theory double copy property, that it's, it's a double copy between the Z functions that contain all your alpha prime corrections and super Yang mills, right? And this would be a champagne ordered open string. And the champagne ordering of the sits solely on the z function, doesn't care about the a, you know, the yang mills function, sits solely on the z function in the integrand ordering. But then there's another ordering, which is the sort of park Taylor denominator of the integrand, and it's that which is being double copied in a field. So it's this ordering that satisfies all the field theory relations we've come to know and love. These n minus 3 factorial and n minus 2 factorial field theory relations are satisfied by this ordering right here. And that is, in fact, double copied with uh, just maximally supersymmetric gang mills to land on open string scattering amplitudes. So let's, we can take seriously these Z functions as encoding predictions for some effective field theory. So you replace the super Yang mills, playfully stripping off the Yang mills and sticking them back on color weights, and dressing these guys with champagne factors renders something that you can recognize as something that looks a lot like a field theory, an ordered field theory amplitude. It only has one color ordering. That color ordering satisfies all the field theory relations you know and love, right? And so, so you dress it with champagne factors, and then all you're left with, the only, thing, the only ordering is this field theory ordering that you're either double copying with color to be talking about Z theory, or you're double copying with Yang Mills to be talking about the open string. So look at these guys. Well, what is it? In the low energy limit, you just land on a, some bicolored theory, right? So the champagne factor goes to this guy, and you get a color weight from, from this guy, right? In higher orders in alpha prime, however, these, these guys, these Z guys, they satisfy Jacobi and anti-symmetry, but they do it in a really fascinating way, depending on both properties of the champagne tracers and algebraic properties of these higher derivative corrections coming in. So these are fascinating objects. 
these guys. These guys are not like the numerators in Yang Mills, which just depend on kinematics, or like color weights. They depend on both together to satisfy Jacobian anti-symmetry. Okay, so let's, let's play. So what, we can, what can we do with these? We can play with the champagne factors. One thing you can do is you can abelianize the champagne factors so that you no longer have any, any champagne factors, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't vanish. Uh, what you get is you get these uh, abelianized amplitudes, all right? Um, the low energy limit, it turns out that the leading surviving correction is the chiral Lagrangian. Um, and this is spectacular and kind of surprising. Or at least it was surprising to me. Um, so the, but what I mean by the chiral Lagrangian, I mean is interacting pions. Um, now, we've known that this guy satisfies n minus 3 factorial relations. You wouldn't think of it, so the action gives you manifestly quartic Feynman rules, right? So you have manifestly four-point interactions, but it turns out you can always assign them to cubic graphs such that they satisfy Jacobian anti-symmetry. And in fact, one of the recent developments was a manifest action written down by Clifford Chung and uh, Xiaoshen Shen at Caltech that, uh, that makes manifest uh, color kinematics and, and cubic Feynman rules. Now, what's fascinating to me is somehow it's this abelianization that's going on in the champagne factors that's encoding a story somehow related to spontaneous symmetry breaking. I don't understand this story. I'd love to understand more of this story. Maybe you guys have ideas about it. Please come speak to me. I'd love to, I'd love to, I'd love to hear about it. Um, <clears throat> let's take a look at the other copy back to the superstring. So the Beale and I superstring is, uh, is Z, uh, the Beale and I Z cross super Yang Mills, and this lands you on is a nonlinear sigma model cross with super Yang Mills. And we will learn from these guys that what we're talking about a supersymmetric Dirac born infeld Volkov Fokulov. The fermionic sector of your supermultiple becomes Volkov Fokulov. The scalar sector of your supermultiple becomes the Dirac in front of your born infeld, and your glue turns into born infeld photons. So for maximal supersymmetry, you have 16 linearly realized and 16 non-linearly -real realized supersymmetries coming from the supersymmetry here and the abelianization that occurred over here. And you've got the tower of alpha prime corrections leading you back to, uh, to this guy. So order by order in higher derivatives, you can play all these constructive games and find various ways of talking about all these scattering amplitudes. An open question as to whether these theories can be understood as to what theories, sorry, an open question as to what theories can be understood as non-trivial double copies. What theories cannot be, we don't know. Um, the amplitudes in this, in the Z, Z amplitudes, now you can say, where, where are my massive modes in my open string? Well, so I'm talking about massless external things, but all the massive modes are sitting inside these Z amplitudes, right? But these Z amplitudes aren't double copying as though they're sitting on massive modes. They're not double copying on massive propagators. They're double copying on massless propagators. And that's very interesting. It's not the first time we've seen this. We've seen this in other examples as well, like, um, like uh, conformal supergravity amplitudes. You can write down this way. They're not unitary, but you can write down conformal supergravity amplitudes as double copies. Um, and they, again, they, uh, they double copy as though they're sitting on massless normal propagators. There's clearly lots of fun games yet to be played. It's very much an open field. Um, I don't have a lot of time left, but I said uh, progress from amplitude. So from means applied to something else. So let me talk about something else that's not amplitude that we're getting progress from, and that's classical solutions. Since we know to all multiplicity, I can talk about gravity predictions for scattering amplitudes in terms of double copies of gauge theory, you can ask yourself a very natural question. Can I talk about classical solutions to Einstein's equations as double copies of gauge theory solutions in some sense, and what would it mean? Um, and uh, so, so Duff, Duff and his friends have been talking about the symmetries, and so, suddenly Anna Curry talked about uh, some, some early uh, like uh, shockwave solutions as double copies. And then a few years ago, uh, Montiero, O'Connell, and White took up this gauntlet and have started really going after this. Uh, and they've been collecting an increasing amount of evidence that the answer is yes, at least for a certain class of solutions, Kerr-Schild solutions. I'll talk about that in a second. 
but also people have been starting to go after general perturbative solutions because after all, some of the fantastic things we can now observe when we set up initial conditions, we're setting them up perturbatively and then, and then we're letting computers take a brunt of it. Um, and then just uh, yesterday, the day before, there was this uh, fascinating paper uh, of scattering on a curved background also satisfying double copy. This is on sandwich plane waves by Tim and, and, uh, and Lionel and, and friends. Okay, so just to uh, close up with this. So in what sense are we setting up some sort of classical double copy? Just to remind you, the gauge here has a color weight and a kinematic weight and some sort of scalar data encoding the propagators, and you're ripping off the color weight and replacing it with a kinematic weight. Um, well, so there's a famous class of solutions for Einstein's equations known as Kerr-Schild, which you express against some, some background, right? So my metric is some background. It doesn't need to be flat. But what needs to happen is that these vectors are null with respect to both metrics. So null with respect to both metrics, and then you've got the scalar. Um, then a single copy interpretation that satisfies uh, Yang Mills equations, or in some cases Maxwell's equations, would be um, rip ripping off one of these uh, kinematic weights of the Kerr-Schild kinematic vectors and replacing it with a color weight. And so there's a whole wide variety of solutions that they talk about. Um, uh, I'm just putting the simplest here, which is, which is Schwarzschild, but of course there's Kerr and Taub Nut and all these fun things, and I encourage you to read these papers if this is the type of thing you're interested in. There's also been multi-center multi black hole solutions in the literature. This is, this is a really fun thing to explore, especially if you like classical solutions. Um, but so what's the, what's the square root of Schwarzschild? It turns out uh, it's just a double copy of uh, the Pelionized point charge in, in a bit of a funny gauge. But, but uh, you can convince yourself this is a gauge away from the, the, um, the familiar form of the Coulomb potential that you're used to. So it's an open question, uh, how far can this go? But these people, especially the ones probing perturbatively, are definitely have an eye on trying to uh, go after some fun observational data now. Um, I should briefly mention that there's all sorts of fun stuff I didn't have a chance to talk about, but this field is spectacular and thriving, and there's stuff that I didn't even have the time to write down on a slide, um, but speak to any of us, and, and we're, we're happy to talk your ear off about all, not just the stuff we're working on, but the stuff that anybody in the field's working on. There's a lot of fun things going on. Um, I'll just show you this thing again. So we talked about discovering new slides, uh, innovative ways of recalculating things leading to new calculations, insight to other predictions, and I'll just close with this slide. Thank you for the PowerPoint talk. All right. So anybody has a question about? Yeah. So, uh, if I am not mistaken, all the theories you described have propagators which go like one over momentum squared. So is, does any of this work for theories where the Absolutely. Goes one over so momentum? so this, this works for massive QCD. Of course, you're talking about different relations, not just adjoint relations. You're talking about other relations that your, that your color weights and the fundamental are taking on, your kinematic weights, have to satisfy that. There's papers on ad adjoint Higgsing in a double copy. I don't think there's been fundamental Higgsing yet, so if you're looking for an open problem, there's that. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's I, not I just massive propagators. I was say, with fermions, like, say, gross nouveau theory or, or, or Trans Simons matter ah, theories or things like well, that. Well, so, um, so it turns out in three dimensions, there's BLG, and BLG doesn't satisfy the, the Lie algebra, it satisfies this three algebra where you have four graphs that, that are, are the algebraic relation involving this weird three bracket, right? Turns out that satisfies color kinematics. You can ask what that squares to. Turns out it squares to the same supergravity theory that three-dimensional super Yang Mills squares to. Um, 
And so, yeah, the fascinating paper is on that. That's the closest I know to, to Trin Simons. All right, more questions? So what happens if you add the high derivative corrections both to young mills and gravity? Is there a sort of double copy version with arbitrary generic effective field theory? So let me see if I understood your question. What happens if I add phi cubed and I take the double copy? Well, let's say we start with R and then we add R with the, with the Einstein theory and then we add high derivative corrections like gauss Bonnet, curvature cube, et cetera. And the same on the young mills side. Is there still some relation between this most generic situation? I, I don't want to make strong claims about the most generic situation, but um, so far we haven't, run into, we haven't run into gravity theories that we can't describe as double copies yet. All right, more questions? Can walk over here. <laughs> uh, what happened in, in terms of the last comment you made about the uh, possibility of seeing a curved uh, solution to Einstein's equations as sort of a uh, double copy of some solutions to Young Mills? What happens, say, in the case of Schwarzschild, uh, to the times in the two uh, gauge theories? Do they run in the opposite way or? sort of same way to get the GR time, or it's not I, 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 I don't know. I, so with the, with the classical stuff, I'm, this is an advertisement for other people's work that I think is exciting, but that has, isn't my own. Okay. Thank you. you. You talked about amplitudes, but I was wondering how much of the structure extends to um, off-shell correlators, just using properties of freely algebras of of operators generating those correlators. Well, so I um, so there have been there have been a few papers written about color kinematics with with entirely off shell correlators, and I think there can be some question about how to interpret what the double copy is. Um, but as I mentioned, one of the spectacular recent calculations before we did the five loop integrand in supergravity was this five loop form factor that Gang Yang calculated, and that definitely had one, uh, one off-shell leg. And if I, if I may follow up, uh, you also primarily use just the Jacobi. You may wonder if you can use higher order generalized Jacobi identities and get further relations. Is that something that just follows in these constructions trivially from the usual Jacobi, or could there be more structure to be discovered? It, it hasn't come up. So what, what has come up is when you have um, color weights that don't satisfy Jacobi's, like when you're talking about the fundamental and you're satisfying commutator relations. In that case, that's, you have, I mean, you have to follow the nose of the color. But, but to our understanding, at least for scattering amplitudes, it's sufficient just to be specifying uh, those, those algebraic relations. All right, so if there is no more question, let's thank the gentleman. Thank you.